Have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Homestay Language Learning, Lisa McDowell here. How can I help you? Hello, my name's Dan. Hello, Dan. And I'm going to be living with a family in Edinburgh for three months, so I'd like some advice on what to bring with me. I'm flying in via Singapore on the 15th. Right. Well, perhaps most important of all are your documents. Vaccination certificate, sponsor's letter, and the certifying letter from us for immigration. Yes, I've got all those in order, I think. What I'm really wondering about are money and clothes and things for my room. Personal effects, in other words. OK. Let's start with cash. You'll already have money in your bank account here, of course, but make sure when you get here you have some cash on you. Pounds, that is, not euros or dollars. How much do you suggest? I'd say 50 as an absolute minimum. OK. Now, the next thing is which clothes to bring. What do you think? Well, as I'm sure you know, it can get pretty cold here, so you will need some warm clothing. There are shops near here that sell winter clothes quite cheaply, so you really don't need to bring much. Do make sure, though, that you have at least one thick sweater and a jacket with you when you arrive here. The temperature is likely to be a lot lower than in Singapore. <laughs> Thanks for the warning. Now, something else I'm not sure about is whether to bring my computer. It's a laptop, so it won't take up much room. Two problems. Firstly, it might not be compatible with the electricity supply in this country. And secondly, there's a risk of it getting broken in transit. Someone travelling here had hers smashed only last month. But surely I can carry it as hand luggage? Usually, yes. But because of all the tight security right now, you may have to check it in. So, my advice is to leave yours at home. OK, I think I will. Is there anything else you'd advise against bringing? Well, you won't need household or cooking things. They'll all be provided. And importing food, of course, isn't allowed by customs. Though, I imagine you already knew that. Well, yes. But there are one or two things I'd suggest you find room for in your suitcase. Yes? Perhaps a few of your favourite cassettes or compact discs. Of course, you might be able to find them in the shops here, but then again, you might not. That's a good idea. Anything else? Yes. Some photographs of people and places that are special to you could be nice. They can really make your room feel like home. <laughs> it's just a thought. Hmm. I'll see if I've got a few good ones. <laughs> Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. Just a few points about packing. Make sure all your cases are clearly labelled, in English, with your host family's name and address, just in case they go missing on the way. It has been known to happen. What name do I write, by the way? It's Wark, Lewis and Amy Wark. So that's W-A-L-K? <laughs> It's actually W-A-R-K. 
But we'll be posting full details to you later this week. Right, fine. And I'd better put some essentials in my hand luggage. Enough for a night or two in case, as you say, anything happens to my main cases. <laughs> yes, I'd recommend a change of T-shirt and socks and so on, plus any medication you may need, and a toothbrush, of course. And my tights. <laughs> Your tights? Yes, for the flight. Wearing them helps prevent deep vein thrombosis when you're <sighs> flying long distances, not getting any exercise. Oh, yes, I've heard about that. Now, talking about exercise, there's one last thing. When you've packed your baggage, check you can carry it, all of it, at least 500 metres without any help. You may have to do that. <laughs> OK. Well, thanks for all your help. You've cleared up a lot of points. <laughs> you're welcome. Have a safe journey, and we'll look forward to seeing you next month. Bye. Bye. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part two. Part two. You are going to hear the director of the Leadership Council give his welcome address at a convention. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Ladies and gentlemen, can I have your attention please? Please find your seats. Snacks will be available all day long. Thank you. Allow me to first introduce myself. I am Joe Steinke, Director of the Leadership Council. On behalf of the Organizing Committee for the 8th Annual Leadership Conference, I welcome you all to San Dimas, California, for a special session on postmodern solutions. We have people attending from as far away as Toronto, New York, and even the Bahamas. Frankly, I wish we had gone to you there. <laughs> but we're very glad you're all here. Let me say further that this will be our largest conference yet. Registrations have far surpassed our expectations. For the first three days, we will be hosting more than 325 participants for lectures and workshops. Another 100 will be joining us for our final two days and culminating session on Friday evening. We also have a larger selection of seminars than ever, a total of 32. Because we know that you all will want to attend a few special sessions, we will repeat key seminars each day. So there will actually be 38 sessions. I'm sure you will all be pleased with the content and the quality of speakers. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Now, for those who have opted not to take part in our bag lunches, there are a number of places nearby that we can recommend. We are 
Located here in the convention center just across the street from the Harford Shopping Mall, and the place we most recommend is Vital's, which is just west across Queen Street on the opposite corner. Please be careful crossing both streets, however, as we don't want to lose any participants. <laughs> if you're not up to Vital's, you can also get some Italian food at the Olive Garden, which is further down Queen Street and east on Danning Avenue, across from the police station. They have a great minestrone soup and excellent breadsticks, all you can eat. On the other hand, if you want some good old American food, you can head to Fuddruckers for some big hamburgers or to the Cattle Company for some fat, juicy steak. Fuddruckers is next to the Olive Garden, but the Cattle Company is back closer to us in the opposite direction of Vital's. Just go east out of the convention center across King Street. It's on the same side as the convention center, so you just have one street to cross. Enjoy. But also, please make sure you are back for the afternoon sessions. These will always start at 1.30 p.m. That will give you an hour and a half for lunch each day. Sessions will be over each day at 5.30. Now, regarding the schedules we've printed out, there have been a couple of last-minute changes. The session titled New Leadership Strategies will no longer be held in Seminar Room 1, but in the main ballroom. This session has garnered much praise and is highly recommended to all, hence the change to a larger room. Another session has been canceled. That session was titled Leading by Serving, and it was scheduled for Daniel's room. The speaker for that session, Dr. Mark Green, had to return home for some urgent health situation. We wish the best to Dr. Green and that all is fine with his family. Finally, the session titled Using the Arts and Media has been changed to the second lounge room, Lounge 2. Please show up promptly for sessions and sit towards the front of each room so that all seats can be utilized. Also, turn off all pagers, beepers, and cell phones. Drinks and snacks will be provided outside each room, but please be careful at your tables. Enjoy the conference. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to Section 3. Section 3. You will hear a discussion between two students and their tutor. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. OK, guys, first off, well done. That was a very good presentation yesterday. Now I'm just going to ask you questions about it before I give you my feedback. Is that OK? Sure. Of course. Right. Well, in that case, tell me, Niall, why did you choose to talk about Rafael Nadal? To tell you the truth, I didn't. I think I... Better let Sheena handle this one. Sheena? Yes, it was my decision to pick Nadal. Now, that might be a strange choice for a presentation entitled Someone Who Inspired Me to Study Psychology, but... Yes, but I was going to say, it does seem rather an odd choice. Was it simply down to the fact that he's a sporting hero of yours and so a role model? You talk about him a lot, Sheena, so this much is clear. It's true, Nadal is someone I look up to, but my reasons for choosing him were totally professional. 
You see, I doubt perhaps in the history of tennis that there was ever a better match player than him. And that got me thinking, what is the secret to his success? How does he control his nerves so splendidly? The more we started to look into his background, the more I realised Sheena was right. Nadal was a perfect candidate for this study. He is, on so many levels, a very well-balanced character and it was fascinating to gain an insight into the mind of this great champion over the last few weeks. I'll admit that I was at first somewhat unsure about whether or not I should back Sheena on this one, but it didn't take long for our research to put us at ease. So, while most of the students were researching Freud and other visionaries in the field of psychology and psychoanalysis, you were looking into a present-day sports star? Does that not strike you as a little odd? Of course, we knew it was a risk. After all, there was a danger that no one, least of all you, would take us seriously. When we stood up on stage and started our presentation. That said, I think it is in the spirit of psychology to be inquisitive and adventurous and not just stick to the conventional. Otherwise, how would the field have come so far as it has done already? Well, I must say, your risk certainly paid off. Yours was, without a shadow of a doubt, the most interesting and original presentation I saw. And judging by the reactions of the other students, I would have to say that everyone else was equally impressed. Thank you. I'm so glad you think so. Yes, but notwithstanding your excellent presentation content we must remember that the marks for this project are awarded based on a number of criteria and we'll examine those in a few minutes but first another question where did you find your sources well and i don't quite know how we managed it but we were able to secure a face-to-face -face interview with nadal while he was over here for the wimbledon tennis championship so we weren't reliant on newspaper articles and interviews or any other forms of secondary sources. We did, however, find the library sports archive an invaluable backup aid to help us fill in the gaps and piece together our interpretation of what makes Nadal such a mentally strong champion. Before you hear the rest of the discussion, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. OK. Well, as I said, congratulations again for your excellent work. Now it's time for my feedback. The first area where marks were awarded is in your use of equipment. I felt that had you not been a little too reliant on the overhead projector, and had you, for example, used the interactive whiteboard and audio equipment a little more effectively, you would have received top marks in this section. As things stand, though, your use of equipment was still very satisfactory. It's just a shame as it was an opportunity missed to score full points. The next area I was asked to assess is content. As you might have guessed, I simply can't fault you on that. Highly original work, so well done. As for your timing, I felt that the two of you were a little too over-rehearsed, so the presentation felt, at times, a little robotic. That said, again, it was very satisfactory, and you would get full points for effort. Sadly, though, there is such a thing as trying too hard, and that cost you top marks here, I'm afraid. Oh, I see. Right. What was particularly impressive, though, was the thick handout you'd prepared for everyone. I took it home to read through it afterwards, and it was very well written. But not alone that, it also enhanced my experience of the presentation itself on the day, as I was able to refer to the handout for further information on what was being discussed and to answer any questions I had. Very nice. As for your level of interaction, 
Well, you had so much that you were intent on packing into your 20-minute time slot that sadly you run out of time at the end, which left no room whatsoever for interaction and no one had the chance to ask you any questions. You've probably guessed, therefore, that you did worse than average in this department and, unfortunately, your score will have to reflect this. Oh, my goodness. Everything sounded so positive at the start. That is a big disappointment. We worked so hard. Now, now, don't be so quick to get deflated. Remember, your presentation skills only count for 15% of the project grade. Your score in this assessment, even if it were terrible, would still not be enough to prevent you from getting top marks overall. It's very hard to score well in the presentation assessment anyway, so believe me, you both did reasonably well. Thank you. I wish I felt like that. Yes, your feedback was very constructive. We're just a little disappointed with ourselves. Why? That's the end of Section 3. You have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a teacher talking about several British art galleries. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 33. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 33. Good afternoon. Welcome to the first class of V100 Art and History. The objectives of the course, as you will have seen if you've taken a look at the syllabus, include familiarizing yourselves with the vocabulary and language of art, learning about the basic elements of art and design, and finally, discussing historical periods as they pertain to art. The course will also give you the opportunity to visit some of the many galleries and museums that Britain has to offer. So, having said that, I'd like to spend the rest of today's class talking about four of the more important galleries that we will be visiting in the coming year. As most of you already know, or at least I hope most of you know, there are four Tate Galleries in all. To begin, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the Tate Modern. Tate Modern is located in a very busy part of London called the South Bank. It's close to two world-renowned tourist attractions, St. Paul's Cathedral and Shakespeare's Globe Theater. Now, interestingly enough, Tate Modern is housed in what was a power station built in several stages between 1947 and 1963. It was closed down in 1981 and reopened as a gallery in the year 2000. Tate Modern consists of five levels, with the Tate Collection being shown on the third and fifth levels. On level two, the works of contemporary artists are exhibited, while level four is used for holding large temporary exhibitions. Since this museum opened, it has become a popular spot for both Londoners and tourists alike. And believe it or not, it doesn't cost anything to get in to see the collection displays. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 34 to 40.
Now listen and answer questions 34 to 40. Now, the second gallery I'd like to talk about is Tate St. Ives, which is in Cornwall. It was built on the site of a gas works, and it overlooks Porthmeor Beach. Tate St. Ives is housed in a three-story building that was designed by the architects Evans and Shalliff. It was established in 1993, seven years before Tate Modern was opened, and the gallery exhibits the works of modern British artists, including members of the St. Ives School, a group of artists living and working in the area from the 30s onwards. In later lectures, we'll be looking at the work of some of the artists who belong to that group and the ways in which they influenced each other. Okay, am I going too fast for any of you? No? Good. Next, I want to talk about Tate Britain, which is a gorgeous gallery situated right in the heart of Westminster. Tate Britain was the first of the four Tate galleries to open, and it was established in 1897. It was built on the site of an old prison, and when it first opened its doors, it was called the National Gallery of British Art. Later, it became known as the Tate Gallery, after the man who founded it, Sir Henry Tate. During its lifetime, Tate Britain has been damaged twice, once by floodwaters from the River Thames and once by bombings during World War II. This gallery has an interesting range of exhibitions of historic and modern art from 1500 up to the present day. Now, the last gallery I'd like to tell you about is called Tate Liverpool. It's not hard to figure out where this gallery is located, is it? It was opened in 1988 to exhibit displays from the Tate Collection, and it also has a program of temporary exhibitions. Tate Liverpool is housed in what was once a warehouse, and for some years it was one of the biggest galleries of modern and contemporary art in the UK. Well, that's a brief overview of just a few of the galleries we'll be visiting. I'd like now to look in a little more detail at what you can expect to see in each of these galleries, starting with Tate Britain. That is the end of Part 4. You now have half a minute to check your answers.